mine uh, was given a barbecue. I was actually staying at his place, and he was given a barbecue by an old friend of, of his. Actually, I know her quite well. And uh, we went up to her place, and she said, uh, you guys want a beer? Or whatever. And we said, sure, we'll stick around. She wanted to show us her, you would call it a man cave. We were talking about, you know, our parents and where we're from and all this kind of thing. And uh, she had mentioned that her father was a uh, was in World War II. And I noticed there was a picture on the wall of a, a group of men. They looked like soldiers and they were, it's like the group shop. And I said, well, hey, my father was in World War II. And she said, my father was actually captured at Dieppe. And I went, whoa. That's, a, that's, that's pretty cool as a coincidence because my father was also captured at Dieppe. And I asked her what it was and she said, it's a picture of uh, my father uh, when the, uh, they got liberated from uh, the prison camp, World War II. They were all captured at Dieppe. So she, she got the picture and uh, brought it down to me. She showed me the picture and all I remember is my buddy who was there said, I went white, my, my, and I can remember my whole body went goosebumps. And I looked at this picture, and my father was dead center in this photograph, about three guys away from her father. Now, we'd been friends all this time, and we never had that conversation. And then that day, we tied the two together that, you know, our fathers were basically prisoners of war for two years. And they actually, it was in Poland when uh, the Germans captured them at Dieppe. They got shipped down to Poland. For the past, I don't know, seven, six, seven years I've been on Facebook, I'd always post a picture of my father in his uniform. Now, what was so amazing because of the reaction I gave to seeing that picture that um, my friend had on the wall, she had a print made and she brought it down to the, my house, framed and everything, and it was very, very emotional. So I made a copy of that picture and I posted it on Facebook. Now, I have a half-brother who lives in England, who's a war baby. We knew all about him and uh, we communicated, he came to visit. Um, I actually went over to England and stayed at his place for a while. And he found me on Facebook, uh, I think, about a year ago. Anyways, when he saw the picture, he texted me on Facebook saying, fantastic, fine, Brian, you know, thank you so much for posting that. And he says, by the way, he had seen a um, auction that was being held in London, England, and it's the theme for that auction was uh, military memorabilia uh, of any type. And one of the items that was up for auction was a diary that was found somewhere in England uh, that was kept by a Canadian soldier. And this is where I'm at. I've got goosebumps right now. The Canadian soldier's name was Lloyd Rutherford, my father, and actually my half-brother's father. And he was overwhelmed at this. And what they did was, you know, there's a catalog for the, pre, like almost like a previewing of all the items that were going to be up for auction. And one of the photographs was a page from the diary. And my father, my father was a bit of an artist not professionally or he didn't really make anything of it other than he was just good at drawing. So the picture was of one of the pages and it had Dieppe written in block letters like, you know, like Hollywood. And, uh, and he also drew the shackles, uh, handcuffs or whatever you want to call it, that the prisoners wore on certain occasions. So he, here's a drawing of the shackles and the title Dieppe. And uh, so that was incredible because I've never, you know, the funny thing was 
I had forgotten all about this, but my sister had reminded me. She said, don't you remember dad saying that he had kept a diary and he wondered whatever happened to it? So now my father's diary has appeared at an auction and my brother called the auction house to see if he could get this diary and they had informed him that the auction had already occurred. Someone had bought the, uh, the diary and my brother asked if he could get the information as to who bought it. Now, because of the, um, the integrity of the auction house, they said that they can't, it's, 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 they can't give this information out. But I know my brother and I know his, his persistence and uh, when he wants something, he, he, I mean, he's financially able to, you know, afford anything, you know, of that nature. He uh, said, can I give you my information and can you get it to the person? And they said, we'll see what we can do. So that's, uh, that's where it's at right now. But what this whole thing does is it takes me back to growing up you know, on the East Mountain of Hamilton, and my father really enjoyed telling stories about, especially about his time in the prison camp. And there were some stories that he would share with us, and uh, it was pretty interesting, and a lot of it funny. Um, one in particular that I remember was, he said that the prisoners knew how to take the shackles off without the Germans knowing, because if they found out, then it would be, you know, hell to pay. So my father would say, what we had to do was, we had, you know, he motioned as if he's wearing the shackles. He says, what, what they would do is they would take their, their wrists and in a certain way they would pop the shackles and they would pop off. So, a great story, I love this story. They got the prisoners to play football, baseball, basketball, or any kind of sport, you know, that was uh, popular in America. They got them to put on little skits, they got them to box. And on this particular day, they were playing football. And when they were finished, my father asked to go to the, the washroom to, uh, you know, wash, clean up, whatever. And they had this, they had put the shackles on the prisoners. So my father's in the facility by himself alone, and uh, he figured nobody's around, especially the Germans. So he popped the shackles off because he wanted to take the top off so he could wash himself under the arms. And, uh, so now he's got the top off, he's got the water, he's washing himself, and he hears footsteps. And he doesn't want to take any chances. He's thinking, you know, it could be a, a, a guard. So what he does is he, he uh, puts the shackles back on. At the same second, realizing his top is off. So he's thinking, he's done. They're done. Because if they find out that they can take the shackles off, it's going to cause so much trouble. And they're going to have to re-figure out how they're going to keep these guys in line. So, sure enough, he's washing his hands, pretending, you know, everything, you know, everything's fine, everything's normal. He looks over and he sees the, it was a German prisoner, or no, sorry, it was a German sol soldier, uh, a guard. He comes in, he looks at my dad, and he looks around, and he leaves. And my father thought he didn't, no didn't notice, or I'm not sure, whatever. So anyways, my father pop the shackles back off, put the top back on, pop the shackles back on, and proceeded to, you know, whatever, leave the facility. But uh, one particular story he, he told when, is when the, uh, the prisoners came into the prison camp, very first day, very first hour. The Germans gave all the prisoners coffee. They gave them all a cup of coffee. Now my father, you would have to know my father to appreciate this, but my father took a sip of the coffee and he spit it out. And uh, because he was just being a wise guy, period. That's the only reason he was doing it. 
He spit the coffee out and he said to the German, he says, you expect us to drink this? And this, the German soldier went, come and gave him 20 lashes, 20 lashes with a leather whip. And my father said, it hurt, but he wouldn't break, he wouldn't break in, he wouldn't uh, give in, and uh, he just took the 20 lashes. And then when he was done, they gave him back to, the, uh, to, to his buddies, and they took him back into the room to uh, put an ointment or something on so it doesn't get infected. And uh, my dad says, uh, his buddy says, my father's nickname was Rocky. He had it tattooed on his arm. And his buddy says, hey, Rocky, we're proud of you. But if you've got to let it go, let it go. Don't worry about it. And my father said he started crying because he was just so overwhelmed with emotion. And he says, plus the ointment hurt more than the lashes did. So those are the, you know, those are kind of the stories that he would tell. Another great story, a really strange story, because the, the town was on rations. There was no cigarettes. There was no chocolate. But because of the Geneva Convention, the prisoners could have chocolate and the prisoners could have cigarettes. Now, the townspeople, they knew this and they thought, what we're going to do, what, 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 what do we have that we could trade? Now, the, the, the farmers mostly had this idea to send their daughters down to entice the soldiers, to, to give them chocolate and to give them cigarettes. Now, because these girls were on the other side of the fence, there was no harm to be, you know. And the girls would expose themselves. They would expose themselves, encouraged by the soldiers, of course, and they would throw the cigarettes and they would throw the chocolate over to the girls. And the girls would take the chocolate and cigarettes back to their parents. And another, another uh, funny story my dad said was um, one, of the, one of the farmers gave, I don't know how it got in there, I forget how he told me, but they snuck a piglet into the prison camp in exchange for cigarettes and chocolate. And the soldiers thought this was great, but then they thought, what are we going to do with this thing? Because, I mean, they wanted to eat it, but if they thought the first you know, attempt at killing the thing is going to cause more you know, commotion than anything, and sure enough, you know, the, the, the piglets started squealing, and the, uh, the the Germans heard that, and I think they all got, like, locked down or whatever, because, you know, they were trying to figure out how the piglet got in there, and the, pig, and the Germans took the pig, and they ate it. My father was a fireman, because I'm not sure if you know this, but in Hamilton, Ontario, in the 40s, to entice the men to join the army, they would say, if you sign up, when you come back, you are guaranteed a job in the fire department or the post office. So when my father came back, he just went to the fire department, showed them, you know, the information that he was, you know, he had signed up, prisoner, whatever, and he was instantly hired. And he was a fireman until he retired in the 70s. One of the amazing things about the computer, besides YouTube, is Google. I punched in my father's name, which I do every once in a while. I punched in my father's name and up came a few, two or three main things. One of them was uh, uh, things that he did as a fireman. and. Uh, one other thing was uh, about the prison, being, you know, prisoner. And the most interesting one was uh, an actual photograph from a news, an actual photograph of the newspaper page. Now, my grandfather, my father's father, Alex Rutherford, lived in Wisconsin. And in the 40s, after my father was captured, my grandfather went to the Salvation Army to make a donation for the war effort, okay? And he said to the, the gentleman at the office, he said, I'm here to make a donation to the war effort. 
And he says, my, I've lost my father, I've lost, I lost my son in, in the war. And, uh, and the gentleman at the, the office said, well, well, wait a minute, what's your son's name? And he said, Lloyd Rutherford. So the gentleman went out of the room, he came back a few minutes later, and he said to my grandfather, your son's alive, and he's been captured, he's in a prison camp in Poland, but he's fine. So, you can imagine the overwhelming emotion that came out of my grandfather going down to make a donation, thinking that he's lost his son, and finding out that he's alive and well. So, the interesting thing also, my father said that uh, he gave a lot of credit to the Geneva Convention. And he said, because that was, that was the, the one thing if anything got kind of weird or anything got a little too unfair or inappropriate, they would just say the words, Geneva Convention, and everybody would relax. My father said he had the utmost respect for the Germans to, to the day he died. I can remember him bumping into people, you know, in the grocery stores and that, if he heard a German accent. He would go to them and talk to them and tell them you know, exactly what he felt and, and what he was, he had been a prisoner. And uh, he, he said that they were treated very well. They were treated like humans, they were treated like men. The interesting thing, though, was when Hitler surrendered, word gets to the prison camp. The Germans lost. Americans, Canadians, you know, won. My father said, the strangest thing is that the Germans basically put down their weapons and said, okay, you guys are in charge now. And, you know, and I don't think it happened this simply, but the Americans and the British came in to liberate the prisoners. And my father said there were German soldiers dressing up like the prisoners, hoping that they didn't have to talk and sort of sneak by and sort of make a run for it or get whatever. But my, my dad also said that uh, all the prisoners, they wanted to take souvenirs. As in, like, my father took a bayonet. And I mean, this bayonet had, like, notches on the, on the thing, you know. He wanted that for a souvenir. So he took it off of a German and uh, put it, I don't know where he put it, put it in his bag or put it in whatever it was knapsack and uh, the Americans came in and said what do you got there and uh, my, my father took it out he says check this this is great it's a great souvenir and he showed the American the bayonet and the American says let me take a look at it and the American looked at it and said thank you and he and he kept it never and you know my father is thinking you know these guys came and you know basically saved us so what is he going to do? Start, you know, start something to get this bayonet back, but he said he's never got the bayonet back. And uh, yeah, that was it. So they were liberated and taken from the prison camps back to England. And uh, yeah, I've seen my father cry twice in my whole life. And I think you, you can share if, uh, if, a, man, if a man has seen his father cry, it, it, it's something that, that, is, that is very... Uh, moving and uh, the first time my father cried was that I saw him cry was when his mother, my grandmother died and the second time I saw my father cry was it was the anniversary of the Dieppe raid and they did a, an article on uh, the local television station and one of the segments said if you or anyone you know that was actually at Dieppe, phone in and we want to talk to you. And this was live on TV. My father called in and he got through and he told him, he talked to the TV station live for about five or ten minutes. And they thanked him for his, his input and my father hung up and we watched him and he broke down and cried like a baby.
we're thinking. All that emotion accumulated from the time in prison camp, up, you know, raising a family, becoming a successful father, fireman. And to me, that was his liberation. He got all of that, all of that out. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty heavy. And I think an, a, an incredible ending to this whole story would be for my brother and I to actually own that diary, to have it back in our family.